Well, here we are, somehow or other, at Governon Hill, during Kartik, all together. I might be dreaming, but if I am, I like it. So, uh, we're coming into some really exciting territory here. We've just started with renunciation of Kardama Muni, and we'll be working on that for a while. So here we are at 3.24 for the official 11. atomic clock. 11. 11. 3.24, 11. Everyone ready? Yes. yes. After worshiping the Supreme Lord with gladdened senses and a pure heart for his intended activities as an incarnation, Brahma spoke as follows to Kardama and Devahuti. As explained in Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, anyone who understands the transcendental activities, the appearance and disappearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is to be considered liberated. Brahma, therefore, is a liberated soul. Although he is in charge of this material world, he is not exactly like a common living entity, since he is liberated from the majority of the follies of the common living entities, he was in knowledge of the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he therefore worshipped the Lord's activities. And with a glad heart, he also praised Kardama Muni, because the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as Kapila, had appeared as his son. One who can become the father of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is certainly a great devotee. There is a verse spoken by a Brahmana in which he says that he does not know what the Vedas and what the Puranas are, but while others might be interested in the Vedas and Puranas, he is interested in Nanda Maharaj, who appeared as the father of Krishna. The Brahmana wanted to worship Nanda Maharaj because the Supreme Personality of Godhead as a child crawled in the yard of his house. These are some of the good sentiments of devotees. If a recognized devotee brings forth the Supreme Personality of Godhead as his son, how he should be praised. Brahma, therefore, not only worshipped the incarnation of Godhead Kapila, but also praised his so-called father, Kalyanu. Lord Brahma said, My dear son Kardama, since you have completely accepted my instructions without duplicity, showing the proper respect, you have worshipped me properly. Whatever instructions you took from me, you have carried out, and thereby you have honored me. Purport, Lord Brahma, as the first living entity within the universe, is supposed to be the spiritual master of everyone. Also the father, <coughs> the creator of all beings. Karta Mamuni is one of the Prajapatis, or creators of the living entities, and he is also a son of Brahma. Brahma praises Kardama because he carried out the orders of the spiritual master in toto and without cheating. A conditioned soul in the material world has the disqualification of cheating. He has four disqualifications. He is sure to commit mistakes. He is sure to be illusion. He is prone to cheat others. And his senses are imperfect. But if one carries out the order of the spiritual master by disciplic succession, or the parampara system, he overcomes the four defects. Therefore, knowledge received from the bona fide spiritual master is not cheating. Any other knowledge which is manufactured by the conditioned soul is cheating only. Brahma knew well that Kardama Muni exactly carried out the instructions received from him and that he actually honored his spiritual master. To honor the spiritual master means to carry out his instructions word for word. Text 13. Sons ought to render service to their father exactly to this extent. One should obey the command of his father or spiritual master with due deference, saying, Yes, sir. Two words in this verse are very important. One word is pitari, and another is guru. 
The son or disciple should accept the words of his spiritual master and father without hesitation. Whatever the father and the spiritual master order should be taken without argument. Yes, there should be no instance in which the disciple or son says, this is not correct, I cannot carry it out. When he says that, he has fallen. The father and the spiritual master are on the same platform because a spiritual master is the second father. The higher classes are called dvija, twice born. Whenever there is a question of birth, there must be a father. The first birth is made possible by the actual father and the second birth is made possible by the spiritual master. Sometimes the father and the spiritual master may be the same man and sometimes they are different men. In any case, the order of the father or the order of the spiritual master must be carried out without hesitation with an immediate yes. There should be no argument. That is real service to the father and to the spiritual master. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has stated that the order of the spiritual master is the life and soul of the disciples. As a man cannot separate his life from his body, a disciple cannot separate the order of the spiritual master from his life. If a disciple follows the instruction of the spiritual master in that way, he is sure to become perfect. This is confirmed in the Upanishads. The import of Vedic instruction is revealed automatically only to one who has implicit faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead and in his spiritual master. One may be materially considered an illiterate man, but if he has faith in the spiritual master as well as in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then the meaning of scriptural revelation is immediately manifested before him. Lord Brahma then praised Kardamamuni's nine daughters, saying, All your thin-waisted daughters are certainly very chaste. I'm sure they will increase this creation by their own descendants in various ways. In the beginning of creation, Brahma was concerned more or less with increasing population. And when he saw that Kardamamuni had already begotten nine nice daughters, he was hopeful that through the daughters many children would come who would take charge of the creative principle of the material world. He was therefore happy to see them. The word Suma Dima means a good daughter of a beautiful woman. If she has a thin waist, a woman is considered very beautiful. All the daughters of Kardama Muni were of the same beautiful feature. Therefore today, please give away your daughters to the foremost of the sages with due regard for the girls' temperaments and likings, and thereby spread your fame all over the universe. The nine principal rishis or sages are Marichi, Atri, Angira, Pulastya, Pulaha, Kratu, Brigu, Vrishta, and Atarva. All these rishis are most important, and Brahma desired that the nine daughters already born of Kardamamuni be handed over to them. Here, two words are used very significantly, yata shilam and yata ruchi. The daughters should be handed over to the respective rishis, not blindly, but according to the combination of character and taste. That is the art of combining a man and woman. Man and woman should not be united simply on consideration of sex life. There are many other considerations, especially character and taste. If the taste and character differ between the man and woman, their combination will be unhappy. Even about 40 years ago in Indian marriages, the taste and character of the boy and girl were first of all matched, and then they were allowed to marry. This was done under the direction of the respective parents. The parents used to astrologically determine the character and taste of the boy and girl, and when they corresponded, the match was selected. This girl and this boy are just suitable and they should be married. Other considerations were less important. The same system was also advised in the beginning of creation by Brahma. Your daughters should be handed over to the rishis according to taste and character. According to astrological calculation, a person is classified according to whether he belongs to the godly or demoniac quality. In that way, the spouse was selected. A girl of godly quality should be handed over to a boy of godly quality. A girl of demoniac quality should be handed over to a boy of demoniac quality. Then they will be happy. 
But if the girl is demoniac and the boy is godly, then the combination is incompatible. They cannot be happy in such a marriage. At the present moment, because boys and girls are not married according to quality and character, most marriages are unhappy and there is divorce. It is foretold in the twelfth canto of the Bhagavatam that in this age of Kali, married life will be accepted on the consideration of sex only. When the boy and girl are pleased in sex, they get married, and when there is deficiency in sex, they separate. That is not actual marriage, but a combination of men and women like cats and dogs. Therefore, the children produced in the modern age are not exactly human beings. Human beings must be twice born. A child is first born of a good father and mother, and then he is born again of the spiritual master and the Vedas. The first mother and father bring about his birth into the world. Then the spiritual master and the Vedas become his second father and mother. According to the Vedic system of marriage for producing children, every man and woman was enlightened in spiritual knowledge. And at the time of their combination to produce a child, everything was scrutinizingly and scientifically done. O Kardama, I know that the original Supreme Personality of Godhead has now appeared as an incarnation by his internal energy. He is the bestower of all desired by the living entities, and he has now assumed the body of Kapila Muni. In this verse, we find the word Purusham of Atinanam Swamayaya. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is everlastingly, eternally, the form of Purusha, the predominator or enjoyer, and when he appears, he never acts, accepts anything of this material energy. The spiritual world is a manifestation of his personal internal potency, whereas the material world is a manifestation of his material or differentiated energy. The word swamayaya, by his own internal potency, indicates that whenever the Supreme Personality of God descends, he comes in his own energy. He may assume the body of a human being, but that body is not material. In Bhagavad Gita, therefore, it is clearly stated that only fools and rascals, mudhas, consider the body of Krishna to be the body of a common human being. The word shivadim, shivadim means that he is the original bestower of all the necessities of life upon the living entities. In the Vedas also, it is stated that he is the chief living entity and that he bestows all the desired necessities of other living entities. Because he is the bestower of the necessities of all others, he is called God. The Supreme is also a living entity. He is not impersonal. As we are individual, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is also individual. But he is the Supreme Individual. That is the difference between God and the ordinary living entities. By mystic yoga and, and the practical application of knowledge from the scriptures, Kapila Muni, who is characterized by his golden hair, his eyes just like lotus petals and his lotus feet, which bear the marks of lotus flowers, will uproot the deep-rooted desire for work in this material world. Purport. In this verse, the activities and bodily features of Kapila Muni are very nicely described. The activities of Kapila Muni are forecast herein. He will present the philosophy of Sankhya in such a way that by studying his philosophy, people will be able to uproot the deep-rooted desire for karma, fruit of activities. Everyone in this material world engages in achieving the fruits of his labor. A man tries to be happy by achieving the fruits of his own honest labor, but actually he becomes more and more entangled. One cannot get out of this entanglement unless he has perfect knowledge or devotional service. Those who are trying to get out of the entanglement by speculation are also doing their best. But in the Vedic scriptures, we find that if one has taken to the devotional service of the Lord in Krishna consciousness, he can very easily uproot the deep-rooted desire for fruit of activities. Sankhya philosophy will be broadcast by Kapila Muni for that purpose. His bodily features are also described herein. Jnana does not refer to ordinary research work. Jnana entails receiving knowledge from the scriptures 
through the spiritual master by disciplic succession. In the modern age, there is a tendency to do research by mental speculation and concoction. But the man who speculates forgets that he himself is subject to the four defects of nature. He is sure to commit mistakes. His senses are imperfect. He is sure to fall into illusion, and he is cheating. Unless one has perfect knowledge from disciplic succession, he simply puts forth some theories of his own creation. Therefore, he is cheating people. Jnana means knowledge received through disciplic succession from the scriptures. And vijnana means practical application of such knowledge. Kapila Muni's Sankhya system of philosophy is based on jnana and vijnana. Lord Brahma then told Devahuti, my dear daughter of Manu, the same Supreme Personality of Godhead who killed the demon, Kaitaba, is now within your womb. He will cut off all the knots of your ignorance and doubt. Then he will travel all over the world. Here the word avidya is very significant. Avidya means forgetfulness of one's identity. Every one of us is a spirit soul, but we have forgotten. We think, I am this body. This is called avidya. Samkshaya granti means doubtfulness. The knot of doubtfulness is tied when the soul identifies with the material world. That knot is also called ahankara, the junction of matter and spirit. By proper knowledge received from the scriptures in disciplic succession, and by proper application of that knowledge, one can free himself from this binding combination of matter and spirit. Brahma assures Devahuti that her son will enlighten her, and after enlightening her, he will travel all over the world distributing the system of Sankhya philosophy. The word Sankshaya means doubtful knowledge. Speculative and pseudo-yogic knowledge is all doubtful. At the present moment, the so-called yoga system is prosecuted on the understanding that by agitation of the different stations of the bodily construction, one can find that he is God. The mental speculators think similarly, but they are all doubtful. Real knowledge is expounded in Bhagavad Gita. Just become Krishna conscious. Just worship Krishna and become a devotee of Krishna. That is real knowledge. And anyone who follows that system becomes perfect without a doubt. Your son will be the head of all the perfected souls. He will be approved by the acharyas, expert in disseminating real knowledge. And among the people, he will be celebrated by the name Kapila. As the son of Devahuti, he will increase your fame. Sankhya philosophy is the philosophical system enunciated by Kapila, the son of Devahuti. The other Kapila, who is not the son of Devahuti, is an imitation. This is the statement of Brahma. And because we belong to Brahma's disciplic succession, we should accept his statement that the real Kapila is the son of Devahuti and that real Sankhya philosophy is the system of philosophy which he introduced and which will be accepted by the acharyas, the directors of spiritual discipline. The directors of spiritual discipline. The word susamata, susamata, means accepted by persons who are counted upon to give their good opinion. Susamata. Sri Maitreya said, after thus speaking to Kardamamuni and his wife Devahuti, Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, who is also known as Hangsa, went back to the highest of the three planetary systems on his swan carrier with the four Kumaras and Narada. The words Hangsena, Yanina are very significant here. Hamsayana, the airplane by which Brahma travels all over Outer space resembles a swan. Brahma is also known as Hangsa because he can grasp the essence of everything. His abode is called Three Dham Paramam. There are three divisions of the universe, the upper planetary system, the middle planetary system, and the lower planetary system. But his abode is above even Siddha Loka, the upper planetary system. 
He returned to his own planet with the four Kumaras and Narada because they were not going to be married. The other rishis who came with him, such as Marichi and Atri, remained there because they were to be married to the daughters of Kardama. But his other sons, Sanat, Sanaka, Sanandra, Sanathan, and Narada, went back with him in his swan-shaped airplane. The four Kumaras and Narada are Naishtika Brahmacharis. Naishtika Brahmachari refers to one who never wastes his semen at any time. They were not to attend the marriage ceremony of their other brothers, Marichi and the other sages, and therefore they went back with their father, Hamsa. O Vidura, after the departure of Brahma, Kardamamuni, having been ordered by Brahma, handed over his nine daughters, as instructed, to the nine great sages who created the population of the world. Kardamamuni handed over his daughter Kala to Marichi, and another daughter, Anasuya, to Atri. He delivered Shraddha to Angira, and Havirbu to Palastya. He delivered Gati to Palaha, the chaste Kriya to Kratu, Kyati to Brigu, and Arundati to Vashishta. He delivered Shanti to Uttarva. Because of Shanti, sacrificial ceremonies are well performed. Thus he got the foremost Brahmanas married, and he maintained them along with their wives. Thus married, the sages took leave of Kardama and departed full of joy, each for his own hermitage, O Vidura. When Kardama Muni understood that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the chief of all the demigods, Vishnu, had descended, Kardama approached him in a secluded place and offered obeisances and spoke as follows. Lord Vishnu is called Triyuga. He appears in three yugas, Satya, Trita, and Dwapara. But in Kali Yuga, he does not appear. From the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj, however, we understand that he appears garbed as a devotee in Kali Yuga. Lord Chaitanya is that devotee. Krishna appeared in the form of a devotee, but although he never disclosed himself, Rupa Goswami could understand his identity, for the Lord cannot hide himself from a pure devotee. Rupa Goswami detected him when he offered his first obeisances to Lord Chaitanya. He knew that Lord Chaitanya was Krishna himself and therefore offered his obeisances with the following words. Now, I offer my respects to Krishna, who has now appeared as Lord Chaitanya. This is also confirmed in the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj. In Kali Yuga, he does not directly appear, but he appears as a devotee. Vishnu, therefore, is known as Triyuga. Another explanation of Triyuga is that he has three pairs of divine attributes, namely power and affluence, piety and renown, and wisdom and dispassion. According to Sridhar Swami, his three pairs of opulences are complete riches and complete strength, complete fame and complete beauty, and complete wisdom and complete renunciation. There are different interpretations of Triyuga, but it is accepted by all learned scholars that Sri Yuga means Vishnu. When Kardamamuni understood that his son Kapila was Vishnu himself, he wanted to offer him obeisances. Therefore, when Kapila was alone, he offered his respects and expressed his mind as follows. Kardamamuni said, Oh, after a long time, the demigods of this universe have become pleased with the suffering souls who are in material entanglement because of their own misdeeds. Purport. This material world is a place for suffering, which is due to the misdeeds of the inhabitants, the conditioned souls themselves. The sufferings are not extra extraneously imposed upon them. Rather, the conditioned souls create their own suffering by their own acts. In the forest, fire takes place automatically, it is not that someone has to go there and set the fire, set a fire. Because of friction among various trees, fire automatically occurs. When there is too much heat from the forest fire of this material world, the demigods, including Brahma himself, 
being harassed, approached the Supreme Lord, the pers Supreme Personality of Godhead, and appealed to him to alleviate the condition. Then the Supreme Personality of Godhead descends. In other words, when the demigods become distressed by the sufferings of the conditioned souls, they approach the Lord to remedy the suffering, and the Personality of Godhead descends. When <clears throat> the Lord descends, all the demigods become enlivened. Therefore, Kartamamuni said, after many, many years of human suffering, all the demigods are now satisfied because Kapiladev, the incarnation of Godhead, has appeared. After many births, mature yogis, by complete trance in yoga, endeavor in secluded places to see the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Purport. Some important things are mentioned here about yoga. The word bahu janma vipakvena means after many, many births of mature yoga practice. And in other words, some yoga samadhina means by complete practice of the yoga system. Complete practice of yoga means bhakti yoga. Unless one comes to the point of bhakti yoga or surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, One's yoga practice is not complete. This same point is corroborated in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Bahunam Jammanamante, after many, many births, the jnani who has matured in transcendental knowledge surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Kardamumuni repeats the same statement. After many, many years and many, many births of complete practice of yoga, one can see the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord in a secluded place. It is not that after one practices some sitting postures, he immediately becomes perfect. One has to perform yoga a long time, many, many births. To become mature, to become mature, and a yogi has to practice in a secluded place. One cannot practice yoga in a city or in a public park and declare that he has become God simply by some exchange of dollars? This is all bogus propaganda. Those who are actually yogis practice in a secluded place, and after many, many births, they become successful, provided they surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the com completion of yoga. Not considering the negligence of ordinary householders like us, that very same Supreme Personality of God, it appears in our homes just to support his devotees. Devotees are so affectionate toward the Supreme Personality of God that although he does not appear before those who practice yoga in a secluded place, even for many, many births, he agrees to appear in a householder's home where devotees engage in devotional service without material yoga practice. In other words, devotional service to the Lord is so easy that even a householder can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead as one of the members of his household, as his son, as Kardamamuni experienced. He was a householder, although a yogi, but he had the inclination, the incarnation of the Supreme Personality of God in Kapilamuni as his son. Devotional service is such a powerful transcendental method that it surpasses all other methods of transcendental realization. The Lord says, therefore, that he lives neither in Vaikuntha nor in the heart of a yogi, but he lives where his pure devotees are always chanting and glorifying him. The Supreme Personality of God it is known as Bhakta Vatsal. He is never described as Jnani Vatsal or Yogi Vatsal. He is always described as Bhakta Vatsal because he is more inclined toward his devotee than toward other transcendentalists. In Bhagavad Gita, it is confirmed that only a devotee can understand him as he is. In Bhagavad Gita, it is confirmed that only a devotee can understand him as he is. Bhaktyamamavijanati. One can understand me only by devotional service, not otherwise. That understanding alone is real because although jnanis, mental speculators, can realize only the effulgence or the bodily luster of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and yogis can realize only the partial representation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a bhakta not only realizes him as he is, but also associates with the Personality of Godhead. 
face to face. Text number 30. Cardamom, when he said, You, my dear Lord, who are always increasing the honor of your devotees, have descended in my home just to fulfill your word of... Sorry. Cardamom, when he said, You, my dear Lord, who are always increasing the honor of your devotees, have descended in my home just to fulfill your word and disseminate the process of real knowledge. Purport. When the Lord appeared before Kardama Muni after his mature yoga practice, he promised that he would become Kardama's son. He descended as the son of Kardama Muni in order to fulfill that promise. Another purpose of his appearance is Chikirshur Bhagavan Jnanam, to distribute knowledge. Therefore he is called Bhaktanamanavardana, he who increases the honor of his devotees. By distributing Sankhya, he would increase the honor of the devotees. Therefore, Sankhya philosophy is not dry mental speculation. Sankhya philosophy means devotional service. How could the honor of the devotees be increased unless Sankhya were meant for devotional service? Devotees are not interested in speculative knowledge. Therefore, the Sankhya enunciated by Kapila Muni is meant to establish one firmly in devotional service. Real knowledge and real liberation is to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead and engage in devotional service. My dear Lord, although you have no material form, you have your own innumerable forms. They truly are your transcendental forms which are pleasing to your devotees. In the Brahma Samhita it is stated that the Lord is one absolute, but he has ananta, or innumerable forms, Advaitam, Achutam, Anadim, Anantarupam. The Lord is the original form, but still he has multiforms. Those multiforms are manifested by him transcendentally according to the tastes of his multi-devotees. It is understood that once Hanuman, the great devotee of Lord Ramachandra, said that he knew that Narayan, the husband of Lakshmi, and Rama, the husband of Sita, are one and the same and that there is no difference between Lakshmi and Sita. But as for himself, he liked the form of Lord Rama. In a similar way, some devotees worship the original form of Krishna. When we say Krishna, we refer to all forms of the Lord, not only Krishna, but Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Narayan, etc. The varieties of transcendental forms exist simultaneously. There is al- that is also stated in Brahma Sanghita. Ramadimutishu Nanavataram. He already exists in multi forms, but none of the forms are material. Sridhar Swami has commented that Arupina, without form, means without material form. The Lord has form, otherwise, how can it be stated here? Tanyeva te birupani rupani bhagavamstava. You have your forms but they are not material. Materially, you have no form, but spiritually, transcendentally, you have multi-forms. Is that a question mark? <laughs> is it there in yours? Yeah. Yeah. My body philosophers cannot understand these transcendental forms of the Lord and being disappointed, they say that the Supreme Lord is impersonal. But that is not a fact. Whenever there is a form, there is a person. Many times in many Vedic literatures, the Lord is described as Purusha, which means the original form, the, o- the original enjoyer. The conclusion is that the Lord has no material form, and yet according to the liking of different grades of devotees, he simultaneously exists in multi-forms, such as Rama, the Shringa, Varaha, Narayan, and Mukunda. Let's try that together. Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Narayan, Mukunda. Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Narayan, Mukunda. So on the break, if it, the first thing you say to anybody, you should be, Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Narayan, Mukunda. Do you know how to get down to the Govindakum? Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Narayan, Mukunda. There are many thousands and thousands of forms, but they are all Vishnu, Tattva, Krishna. 
And now we'll take a few reflections or questions. And the first one is Rama Nishinga Varaha Naray Mukunda. <laughs> so it was appropriate, okay. Hare Krishna. I thought it was a d- sweet description here of the, the way that Kardama Muni approached his son, that when no one was around in a private place, he went and offered his obeisances and prayers to him. I'm imagining that in other scenarios, when people are around, he's just acting like a dad, mm. you know, holding the baby and kuchiku and <laughs> all that. And then <laughs> when no one's around, he's like, Supreme Personality of Godhead, please accept my humble obeisances. Nice. So it's just like an yeah. interesting internal, external uh, dynamics and how he expresses his awareness appropriately. Nice that you pointed that out. Yes, I'm your prof. Thank you. Ramanga Varaha Narayan Mukunda. Also, in verse 13, Srila Papa talks about um, the chaste and simple uh, dedication of the, of the disciple to the Guru's orders. And he says, the words of the spiritual master and father should be accepted without hesitation. And, uh, you know, simple yes, there's no argument. As soon as there's an um, instance of this is not correct, I cannot carry it out, then they, they're fallen. And the purport really kind of just elaborates on that. Can you kind of um, place that in context with, you know, the, really the whole Bhagavad Gita being Arjuna surrendering, but then asking question after question and really expressing doubts and having those doubts, you know, answered to the point where he's, yep, I give up. I, I totally agree. I'm on board. Uh, how does that all fit into the same package? Does it appear? It appears in a way like he's arguing. That's the system is that the guru is meant to remove the doubts and one has has to ask these kinds of questions and not be lazy about it. It says Kavraj Goswami in the Chaitanya Charnamita, Siddhanta Baliya Chaitanakara Alash. Ihahwiti Krishna Loge Sudrid Manash. Don't be alash or don't be neglectful or lazy about asking questions that may seem controversial because then one can come to siddhanta. Siddhanta means what something is and also what isn't. Very precise understanding of the truth. And inquiry is invited. Tasmad gurum prapadyaita jignasu shreya utamam. You should inquire but about the absolute truth. One shouldn't put forth, Prabhupada said, absurd inquiries. There's an absurd inquiry on record in Japan. Um, what's his name? Sri Charanam? <laughs> I guess he was a bhakti at that time. He asked Prabhupada if he ever met Indra. Probably considered that an absurd inquiry. And uh, So one should ask questions, but then it should be done in the mood of coming to a conclusion so that one can say yes sir and carry out one's duty. Sometimes one has to clarify one's duty. Sometimes, you know, Prabhupada asked several times from his guru what it is. And it's also, as I just pointed out, you should be inquisitive, which means that you should ask about any doubts that you have that should they should be removed. So in other words, in context with all the other instructions, it's not illegal. But the mood is that I'm asking from the authority to remove the doubt, not to challenge to find uh, s- some other authority. I was just remembering a Prabhupada story that um, there was one devotee, I can't remember his name, but Srila Prabhupada asked him to go to Iceland, to Reykjavik, and open a center. And um, he was feeling, he had doubts about his ability to do so. But he felt like, oh, Prabhupada asked me to do it. And his godfather was saying, no, oh, Prabhupada said, you know, with with the instruction of the guru comes the empowerment, and so he went. But then, when he got there, he was he tried to do something, but it wasn't really taking off. And then he just kind of got into in a, in a spiritual slump himself. He even, you know, wasn't doing his sadhana very well. And then he he ended up coming back, 
and then uh, he was sort of, you know, feeling ashamed, and he approached Srila Prabhupada, and he said, Prabhupada, I'm really sorry I disappointed you, and and then Prabhupada asked me, like, what happened? He said, yeah, I I had a feeling I wasn't going to be able to do it, and I was right, basically. And then Srila Prabhupada, I mean, this is not exactly the words I'm paraphrasing. And, and Srila Prabhupada said, um, well, why didn't you tell me? You know, why didn't you express your doubts and explain your situation? So from that, we can kind of gather that um, while one may want to say, yes, sir, we also need to understand the reality of the situation and our own uh, perhaps limitations and maybe express something like, yes, sir, I would like to do it, but I might need a little support, you know, maybe. Some that happened in the case of uh, the two months for the uh, Sri Chaitanya Charamrita Marathon because um, you can pass the Deva Ratha because Rameshwar tells how Prabhupada gave the instruction. Rameshwar said it's impossible. Prabhupada said it's not impossible. Then Rameshwar said as soon as, and Prabhupada walked away and Rameshwar stood there along with Radha Balava and they were thinking what to do. And as soon as they accepted it, they accepted the order, he said that's when they started getting the ideas of how it could be done, but they needed concessions. So then they caught up to Prabhupada and said, we, we'll do it. We can do it, but we need concessions. And they gave him a list of concessions. One of the main ones was about the art, because that's what took the longest. They wanted to be able to use f photography rather than art to get it done. And they also wanted everyone to come to Los Angeles, etc. So that's another case. Yes, sir, but I need support and a concession to do it. Giraj Swami explains in his book, I'll Build You a Temple, how the beginning of the book starts with Maharaj receiving an instruction from Srila Prabhupada that you should write. And then Giraj Swami becomes quite focused on that. But then the Juhu project comes into his life and he's not able to write. And he goes to Prabhupada with a doubt. You know, Prabhupada, you asked me to write. I, with all this management, I can't write. I'm not a very good manager, but I want to serve you. And then Prabhupada says, no, no, this, the instruction of the spiritual master can not be denied, but it can be postponed. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Okay. We have Gopal and then Saka. Um, Hare Krishna. I appreciate it in the purple of 30, where... Um, Therefore, he is called Bhaktanam Mana Vardhanan, he who increases the honor of his devotees. By distributing Sankhya, he would increase the honor of his devotees. So, by the distribution and expansion of Krishna consciousness, um, Krishna also gives honor to the devotees. Thank you. Nice observation. I thought that was also an inspiring point. And Krishna Saka for the close, and then we'll take a cow break. It's eight, um, it is eight in text sixteen. Keep it close. He has now assumed the body of Kapila Muni. He has assumed. Also, it was said that he entered the semen of Kardama Muni. So, you know, it would have become body. How can we understand it is transcendental? Well, he explained that part earlier about how the Lord can have decide to appear through any medium. He's already everywhere. So it's not as if he has to come somewhere. He's already there existing in in every element, in every atom and so forth. And so when he appears through, as he said before, take shelter of the semen of Kapila Muni, of uh, Kardama Muni, that was his choice of how to appear. Was that the question, the, f the second yeah. question? Yeah, so that was something probably explained. He said just like the boar came out of Brahma's nose. It's like, how did you do that? It's like, well, you do whatever he wants. And so it, it's in that vein. And the first question was about assume. He assumed the body of Kapil Muni. It feels like it's not so, eternal. It's semantics. 
semantics it just means it's word choice. And the tattva is that the the form of kapila is eternal, always exists. And so when it says assume, it's a, it's a, a kind of semantic understanding that at a particular time place that eternal form manifest comes present before everyone's eyes but so it's already there all the forms of the lord are eternal they've always existed they always will exist so it's not like it's conjured or there's some new thing now we're going to take cow break and we'll be back here at 15 minutes past the hour that's a long break you can thank me later Hare Krishna Gaur Premanande Haribo Thank you.